here we go. I'm on now. It's great to have over 100 people on our platform leading us in worship, wasn't it? God bless you guys, choir and orchestra and everyone. We do want to say a word of welcome to those that are joining us from our Olive Drive campus or from our Mount Vernon campus or on a television or a computer, wherever you might be part of our service. We are thankful that you're with us today. Now, I want you to open your Bibles with me. If you have a Bible with you, we'll try to put things on the screen. But open your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, chapter 2, for a message I'm calling God's Amazing Grace. I want to read for you one of the clearest passages, I think, in all of the Bible about what we call salvation. That is, how we are made right with God. And so I'm going to read it, and then we'll look at it in detail along the way. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, and verse number 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. John Newton lived in England in the 1700s. Uh, He had a godly mother who died when he was only six years old. His father was absent from the home most of the time because he was a captain of a ship and he was out to sea for months and months at a time. John Newton went to sea with his dad when he was only 11 years old. He quickly became thoroughly corrupted by the sailors that were on board. By by his own testimony, during his teenage years, he said he could hardly utter a word that was not profanity. As a young man, he became very vile and wicked by anyone's definition. He was perhaps as far from being a Christian as a person could be. He eventually, Newton became the captain of his own ship. And he engaged in the slave trade of that time. He would sail from England to the coast of Africa, and there he would buy human beings. And then he would return to England and sell them for a profit. You cannot imagine a more despicable person than John Newton. On one of his voyages, he became very ill. The sailors on board did not expect him to live. And so they left him in Africa. The only way that he could survive is he became a slave himself. And so for two years, he had nothing to eat except the scraps off the floor that his mistress would would toss to him as he recovered from his illness. His father, back in England, learned of his son's condition and uh, asked a friend who was sailing to Africa if he would look for his son. Miraculously, or seemingly miraculously, they found him. And not only did they find him, but they rescued him from his slavery. And it was, as he was on board the ship, on his voyage back to England, he had a lot of time on his hands because he wasn't really part of the crew. And there, there was a number of Christians on board that particular ship, and they gave him a book by Thomas Akempis called The Imitation of Christ. Newton read it really as a diversion, simply something to do. And in fact, he read it more out of derision. He wanted to be able to make fun of the Christians who were on board. The ship was caught in a horrible storm. Everyone on board thought the ship was going to capsize. Many men, in fact, lost their lives as they were swept overboard and out to sea. John Newton was convinced that he had only moments to live. And so he cried out to God, and he said, save me. And when he said that, he didn't simply mean save me from the storm because he was absolutely convinced that he was going to die. For him, it was a spiritual prayer from his heart. He says, saying, save me from my sin. John Newton survived the storm, as did the ship. But Newton was radically and dramatically saved spiritually. He was born again in those moments by the 
grace of God. And he became one of the greatest leaders of the abolition movement in England. I mean, think of the perspective he had. He had hauled human cargo. He had bought and sold slaves. He himself had lived for two years under the degradation of being a slave himself. He became one of the greatest opponents to slavery, which eventually led to slavery being stamped out in England. He also became a pastor. He was never famous or prominent as a pastor, but he did publish a book of hymns. And one of those hymns has survived to this day, Amazing Grace, the most popular Christian song of the last several generations. He wrote Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me. And he really was, a, had lived a wretched life. I once was lost, he wrote, but now I'm found. Did you know that that is the message of the Bible? Grace. A right relationship with God is not based upon our performance. It's not based upon our merit. John Newton was saved by uh, grace. He was not saved by his good works. I can't find a single good deed that he did up until the storm. He was an awful, a wicked man, and he was saved by the grace of God. And that's how we come to God. We don't come based upon our good works. We don't come based upon human achievement. And you may be thinking, whoa, wait a minute, pastor. Wait, then why did God give the Ten Commandments? Why did he give the commandments if, if, and the Old Testament law if we're not made right with God based upon keeping them? Well, the New Testament tells us that the law of God or the commandments of God are like a mirror that we hold up in front of our face. And we look into the mirror of the perfect law of God. And you know what we see? We see ourselves. We see our failure. We see ourselves as God sees us. We see ourselves as a sinner having violated the commandments of God. We have broken both the, both the word and the will of God. And so in some ways, the commandments of God were given to frustrate us, to show us our inability to, to keep the full law and the perfect law of God so that in our frustration, we would cry out to God for mercy. You cannot earn your salvation that rightness with God. You certainly cannot buy it. Christianity then is not about rules. It is about a relationship with God. Now, our culture doesn't get that. If a Christian character is depicted in a movie, it's always someone that's bound up and seemingly with rules and and rituals. And some people in our culture, maybe most people in our culture, think that being a Christian is about living by a certain code. You have to keep certain rules and regulations and rituals and restrictions, and there's taboos to avoid. And others say, no, Christianity is not about a code, it's about a creed. You have to believe certain things. You have to cross every T and you have to dot every I concerning the propositions that, that you believe. Others say, no, it's not about a code. It's not about a creed. It's about a cause. You have to love everyone. You have to live a kind and, and benevolent lifestyle. Others say, no, it's not a cause. It's a, it, it's a, it, it, it's a church. You, you have to be a member of a certain sect or a certain denomination. No. Christianity is fundamentally about a relationship with God through Jesus. It is based upon his grace and our faith. Now, if Christianity was based upon our good works, we can never quite be sure. How would we know that we have done enough to earn God's favor? Let's say that you live a good life. You, you, you live a very kind life. You help little old ladies across the street, and you help people in need, and then one day you have a bad day, and you mess up, and then you're hit by a Mack truck. And the last thing that you, in your life, was a bad day. The last thing in your life is you, you messed up. If God's love is dependent upon your goodness, then when your goodness changes, God's love towards us would change, wouldn't it? But God's love is not a reaction to us. It is an action towards us. God does not change us so that he can love us. He loves us so that he can change us. 
And that's not just semantics. That is the crux of the gospel. And yet we live in a culture where so many people are trying to live good enough so that God will love them. They think, oh, if I could just be good enough, if I could go to church enough times, then I could earn God's favor. And uh, if we come to God, though, based on human achievement, then here's the big question. Why the cross? If it's based upon our goodness, then why did Jesus die? The Bible clearly tells us that he died paying the penalty of our failure, paying for our guilt, paying for the penalty of our sin. Now, in the New Testament, those who are believers are often called the children of God. There's a big difference between a son and a servant. A servant is accepted on the basis of what they do. They, a servant is accepted on the basis of performance and workmanship, but a son is not accepted on the basis of what they do, but on the basis of who they are. They have a relationship with the Father. And that's how we come to God. God's love for us is absolutely unconditional. There's never been a moment in any of our lives, our most shameful moments, our, our most embarrassing moments, there's never been a moment where God did not love you. God, and it's unconditional. God doesn't say, I love you since you're trying so hard. He said, doesn't say, I love you because you're so sincere. I, I will love you if you behave. I'll love you if you get it together. His love is unconditional. Now, that is so foreign to us. Most of the time, our love for other people is conditional. I love you if you reciprocate and you love me back. I love you since you're one of the beautiful people. I love you after you get it together. I love you because you're the way you are. But a relationship with God is based upon his unconditional love and his grace. Now, sometimes in sharing the gospel, we will ask people a diagnostic question. We'll say, if you died today and stood before God, and God, what if God asked you, why should I let you in my heaven? What would you say? It really is a good question. And if you were to die, which you will, and if you were to stand before God, which you certainly will, why should God let you in heaven? About 90% of the answers that you receive to that question show a lack of understanding of grace. People answer it like this. They'll say, well, God should let me into heaven because I, I, I've lived a good life. I'm sincere. I'm a good neighbor. I've done the best I could. I paid my bills on time. As if God's going to consult your credit score about whether you go to heaven when you die. Most people think they're going to heaven when they die. And yet the Bible says, few find the narrow way. A few years ago, there was a survey done asking people about uh, certain people that were well known whether they went to heaven or not when they died. 79% of Americans said they believed that Mother Teresa went to heaven when she died. She lived, by most accounts, a, 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 a life of benevolence and a good life towards others. So 79% said that they thought that Mother Teresa went to heaven when she died. And yet, 87% said they themselves were going to heaven when they died. They weren't so sure about Mother Teresa, <laughs> but they were sure they were going. You know why? Because we think that we're going to do something great someday. We're going to get it all together someday. Someday we're going to do something so good that God is going to accept us. But listen to what Jesus said in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way to God is through Jesus and faith in him. Now, in the passage that we read in Ephesians, I want to look at three great words in that passage. Now, I warn you, they're kind of theological words. They're churchy words. Sometimes when we come to church, it's nearly like we use a different language. But these are important words that all of us need to understand. The first word is saved. In Ephesians 2, verse number 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Here's the principle. As sinners, we all need to be saved from the penalty of sin. Four men at Oxford 
did a research project a number of years ago. And they researched sermons that were in print, spanning over a 100-year period of time. They were looking to see how the nomenclature changed in sermons. And they found in the late 1800s that nearly every sermon that they researched, when they talked about salvation, what we call salvation or being made right with God, they used the word saved. That's a great Bible word. People who come to Christ have been saved. But that nomenclature changed in the 1920s. It changed in America under the ministry of Billy Sunday. He was a great American evangelist. And instead of speaking of being saved, he began to talk about being converted. The word converted means to be changed. It carried with it the idea of repentance, that you turn from your sin and that you turn to Christ, and it brings this change within your life. Then the nomenclature changed again in the 1950s, in the 1960s, under Billy Graham. And he began talking about making a decision for Christ or accepting Jesus as your Savior. And we still use that nomenclature somewhat today, and I'm not saying that it's wrong. But did you know that the Bible seldom talks about accepting Christ? The biblical word is saved. Saved implies danger, doesn't it? It implies urgency. If we say you need to make a decision for Christ, you can kind of take your time and make up your mind. But saved implies urgency. Saved is something that God does, except in Christ, the emphasis on something that I do. And there's a big difference, isn't there? What does it mean to be saved? The word saved simply means to be rescued from danger, right? I mean, if you're on a ship and you fall overboard and you can't swim and someone dives in and they pull you out, you have been saved. Your house is on fire and a fireman pulls you out, you have been saved. You're guilty as a felon and you're on death row and a governor pardons you, you have been saved. On a spiritual level, it means you have been rescued from the penalty of your sin. You see, the Bible teaches that every human being except Christ has sinned. There doesn't mean just murder or a, or a pedophile. It's an archery word. It means to miss the mark. The mark is the moral perfection of God. And all of our lives have missed that. And the penalty for that is to be separated from God. But Jesus came to save us. It's not just about eternity and going to heaven when we die, as wonderful as that is. But you know what sin does to us? Sin makes a mess of our life. When you violate the Word of God and the will of God, it creates this cascading mess within your life. And yet, we have all sinned. Our sin is like baggage that we're tied to. We have this huge baggage, and it's stuffed full of all of our failure, and we're tied to it. And throughout our life, we're pulling all of our failures of our past and all the guilt of the past. We're pulling it. And when we're saved, Jesus cuts the rope, and we're free. Not only of the penalty of sin, we are free of the guilt of sin. And he changes our life. In fact, he says, you are born again. There's another great word in this passage, though. Not only the word saved, but grace. Look again in Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that of yourselves is the gift of God. Here's the principle. Grace involves God extending mercy and forgiveness apart from any human merit. Grace means, fundamentally, unmerited favor. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. In the original language of the New Testament, there's a definite article in front of the word grace. For by the grace you have been saved. The grace. The grace of God allows us to enter into a relationship with God. It's not about trying harder. It's not about doing better. Sometimes we come to church and we hear a sermon and we say, oh, I've got to try harder. I, I've got to do better. The gospel is not a self-help program. The gospel is not about five ways to feel better about yourself or ten ways to live without stress. The word gospel means good news. And the good news is that God loves us. And that God is willing to extend grace and forgiveness to us. Every few years, there's a trial that the pundits name as the trial of the century. It's interesting how many trials of a century there can be. 
But one of the original trials labeled that was that of the Rosenbergs. It was a husband and wife that were convicted as spies, and they were both sentenced to death and both executed. One of the lawyers, in summing up the case in the, in the penalty phase for Ethel Rosenberg, said, Your Honor, all my client wants is justice. And the judge interrupted the lawyer and said, Excuse me, you mean she wants grace or mercy, not justice. And that's what I want. That's what we all should want. I don't want justice. I don't want what I deserve as a sinner. I want mercy. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Sometimes people will ask and they'll say, are you certain that you're going to heaven? And most Christians will say, yes, I'm certain when I die, I will go to heaven. Our culture reads that as arrogance. They read it as arrogance because our culture thinks that going to heaven is based upon a person's goodness. So they think, When you say, I know I'm going to heaven, they think that's prideful, that's arrogant. You think you're so good. No. Our confidence is born out of humility, out of an utter dependence upon the grace and the forgiveness of God. There's another great word in this passage. Faith. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Here's the principle. The grace of God is appropriated through faith. God offers his grace, unmerited favor to us. How do we receive it? We receive it through faith. You say, okay, then then I just had to believe. As long as I'm sincere, it doesn't matter what I believe. I just have to have faith. It does matter what you believe. You can drink a big liquid from a big glass that you think is orange juice, and you sincerely think it is orange juice, But if it is poison, instead, you will be sincerely dead. The object of our faith, the object of our confidence does matter. Faith is not just positive thinking. It's not simply being optimistic. Saving faith has to be in Jesus. Now, how do we express that faith? I think in a couple of ways. Paul said in Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. We come to a realization that we're a sinner. We've looked in the mirror of the law of God and we have not measured up. And we call upon the name of the Lord and we cry out to him for mercy. But then there's also repentance. Repent means to turn from our sin. I'm not saying you have to do penance. I'm not saying you have to have all your spiritual ducks in a row, that you have to clean up your life. But there must be a willingness to turn from a lifestyle of sin and turn to Christ. Otherwise, it would be what Dietrich Bonhoeffer coined the term cheap grace. So faith is expressed in repentance and in prayer, calling on the name of the Lord. But there's another great word here in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Here's the principle. Every aspect of our salvation is a gift from God. It says, and that not of yourself. What is the antecedent of the word that? All of it. Being saved is a gift. Grace is a gift. Even our faith is a gift. That little word, gift, shatters the last vestige of our pride. That somehow it's something we do. And maybe we think, well, at least I was smart enough to believe. No, even your faith is a gift. God initiates our salvation by convicting us of our sin and convincing us that we are sinners. And then he draws us to himself through the Holy Spirit. We find two negative clauses in this passage as well at the end of verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. That's humanism. Here's the principle. Salvation is not based upon secular humanism. Humanism is the idea that man can save himself. That if you mess up, just try harder. If you mess up, turn over a new leaf. If you mess up, reform your life. If you mess up, clean up your character. It's spiritual Darwinism. Darwinism teaches that man is going to overcome. Given enough time, we will evolve. And man's going to overcome the problems of racial prejudice, the problems of poverty, 
the problems of injustice. Man's going to solve all the problems without God. Man's going to pull himself up by his bootstraps. He's going to solve the problems of sin. No, we need the grace and the forgiveness of God. Michelangelo, in many ways, embodied the humanistic spirit he did a series of sculptures. The first sculpture was a slab of marble, and there was just the hint of a man's face in the first slab. And the next slab is just the man was pulling himself out. You could see his hands, and, and now you could see his face. In the third slab of marble, it was as if a man was setting up, and you could see the indenture of where he'd been sitting in the slab. And then the last one, the man was standing up, and you could see the full indenture of, of where man had been laying in the slab of marble. It depicted in Michelangelo's mind the man is going to somehow pull himself out of the spiritual stone age. Man is going to pull himself up and solve the problems of life and solve poverty and justice and the social issues of his day. The Bible gives the death blow to humanism. It says, it is not of yourselves. No human being is going to be good enough in order to please God in of themselves. So it is not of secular humanism. But the next principle, salvation is not only not based on humanism, it is not based on, on religious legalism. Verse number 9 of Ephesians 2 says, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not about religious works. If it were, we would surely boast. If you were so good that God looked down and said, oh my, that person is so good. They go to church all the time. They gave a kidney to a sick kid. They're so good, I'm going to let them into heaven. No one would ever hear the end of it. We'd be telling everyone, did you, did you know how good I am? I'm so good, God's going to let me into heaven when I die. And there's people like that. There are religious people who are so proud that they can strut sitting down. <laughs> Have you ever met someone like that? They tell you all about their goodness. They think that somehow that's going to please God. Doing good works and keeping religious rituals won't make you upright. Now, it may make you uptight, but it will never make you upright. What does it mean, not of works? Works are the things that people do thinking that will ingratiate them to God. And there's different kinds of works. There's the works of self-affliction. We don't really buy into that as Americans, but many people around the world do. In Hindu lands, a holy man will hold his hands up as he's in a trance, and he'll hold them up as long as he can, and then someone else will help hold them up and hold them up for hour after hour until the blood drains and his arms become lifeless and useless, all in the name of self-affliction. Think of Islam. In the southern part of Iraq, the Shiites at a certain time of year will walk through the streets by the tens of thousands. And they'll, you've probably seen it on television. They, they'll have whips and they'll beat their backs and, and they'll lacerate their backs until the blood runs down. It's the work of self-affliction, thinking somehow that will appease God. Even in a sophisticated culture, a country like Japan, a highly technical worker will take a break and go to the company Zen priest. And the priest will ask him senseless questions as he beats him with a stick. That's the work of self-affliction. Then there's the works of religious ritual. People think, oh, I'm going to please God by avoiding taboos or by eating certain foods or worshiping on a certain day and then they're are going through certain rituals in spain there's a custom of romaria at a certain time of the year people take their relatives who are very very ill and they place them in caskets these are not people that are dead these are people that are severely ill and they carry the caskets through the streets and their relatives come behind scrubbing the streets on their knees until their knees are a mass of blood and torn cartilage thinking somehow that ritual will please God. And then there's the American version of religious works. Bringing a little baby to a church altar and splashing water in their face thinking that will make them right with an eternal God. The works of ritual and self-affliction. We're not too much into that as Americans, but we have an American version of good works, kind of a Boy Scout version. 
thinking that we're going to please God by living a good life and doing benign deeds. That's as old as Judaism. Thinking that we can establish our own righteousness based upon our goodness. You ask people, why should God let you into heaven? And they'll say, well, I, I'm living by the Ten Commandments. Are you? Are you really? Have you read that one about lying? <laughs> if you go to Disneyland, on some of the rides, there's a sign that says you have to be so tall to get on the ride. And you see little children stretching, trying to measure up to the sign. It's as if in the gate of heaven, there's a sign that says you have to be so tall to get in. But it's a thousand feet high. Some people are taller than others, but no one is tall enough. No one is good enough. We've all sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. No one's going to measure up on their own. We're in desperate need of the grace of God. The old comedian Bob Hope used to say, I do benefits for all religions because I don't want to blow it on a technicality. <laughs> Did you know that Christianity is based upon a technicality? The resurrection. If Jesus' body has long since turned to dust, buried in a forgotten tomb somewhere in Jerusalem, then we really have no hope today because a dead Savior is no Savior. But throughout the day, we will gather today by the thousands on behalf of one, not on behalf of one that was alive and is now dead, but on behalf of one that was, alive, was dead and now is alive because he died for us and he conquered death. And because of that, he can extend salvation and forgiveness. And that is God's amazing grace. I had every intention of ending the sermon right here until late last night. I want to take just a few moments and talk about Easter traditions. Most of us have Easter traditions. You, your family may have a tradition of a brunch on Easter where you get together as a family. You may have a tradition of worshiping together on a Sunday morning, which is a wonderful tradition. You may have a tradition of meeting after church and maybe a barbecue outdoors as the children hide Easter eggs and hunt them. And all those things are wonderful as far as our connection as family. I want to tell you about a peculiar tradition that I have and that I've had it for a long time. As a founding pastor of Valley, this tradition for me encompasses the entire history of our church of every Easter. It began, my tradition did, in 1984. My wife and I, we were in our late 20s. Our oldest child, a little girl named Charity, was at Norse grade school on Norse Road. It was the night for her open house. I was away preaching, and Ginger had Charity, and Matthew was four, and Andrew was a baby. Charity that night was hit by a car and was instantly killed. You can imagine the devastation of that. I was totally unprepared for that. In my 20s, I, I probably unprepared at any age. Devastated. She was holding hands, Charity was, with her little brother Matthew, who was four, and she was hit, and he was not. That should have comforted us, but at the time it didn't because we were so broken. Through the years, it's been a great comfort to me. And so I've watched Matt become a man, a pastor, a good husband, a good father of four of my grandchildren. That was 1984. Valley Baptist started, was founded in December of 1985. So our first Easter together as a church was 1986. On that Easter and every Easter since, 
the night before Easter. I have listened to the recording of my daughter's funeral. It's 54 minutes long. I listened to it again last night. We sang it in that service, a few hymns together. Walt and Gayla Brown sang some special music. Walt was our minister of music at the time. Close family friend, a young man that I'd led to the Lord named Marty Haggard, Merle Haggard's son, sang. I gave the eulogy. Pastor Phil preached a beautiful sermon full of hope. You might be curious why I would do such a thing because in listening to it even these years later, many times it brings grief back so fresh and so raw. I do so because when I stand here on an Easter morning, I want to make sure the resurrection is personal to me. And it is. It represents hope that if Jesus rose, that we will rise. Jesus' resurrection validated and vindicated who he was, the very Son of God, the Savior of the world. It validated his words when he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It validated the words of the Apostle. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It vindicated the words of the apostle when he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But here's what you may not realize. It's personal for you too. This life is very, very brief. As a pastor, I've stood at a graveside and led a service well over a thousand times. It's personal. Someday you will stand before God. And someday the resurrection will mean everything. 